Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rem Karinkama, and today on Run It Back, the show in which it takes you back to poker videos from the past, the most amazing shows we've ever made, iconic final tables, and today we're diving into some epic high-stakes poker cash game action from season one. And who else but Elia Lezra to join me on the show? My friend, how are you, first and foremost? Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and of course, we're diving into the past. Um, old school poker stores, you're seeing some of the faces right now uh, at the Golden Nugget as you guys were playing on season one. Um, when, you, when you see this intro, when you see these faces, what are some of the first things that come to mind? Oh, when I see that, it just telling me, I mean, what, first I'll tell your fans that what you're doing over here is the most amazing thing that High sex poker is what got all of us famous. I think that's what got poker on the map, you know? And uh, for you to go back and to, you know, operate on some of those shows and to show us back then playing versus the new players is just the most amazing. I mean, I've told, I told so many people that no one we know who is Elia Lezra without this high stakes poker. With all the respect, I won one WPT and I did some of the stuff, but the high stakes poker, people used to stop me in airport in Greece, in airport in, in, in Melbourne. It's just the most amazing shows and I just loved it. Yeah, it, it's iconic still to this day. Uh, the first seven seasons that were taped, obviously, uh, those are part of poker history. And now we brought back High Stakes Poker. Season eight is now available on Poker Go. Um, new episode every Wednesday night. If you're new to the show, if you've never seen the new season, um, it has Tom Dwan, it has Phil Ivey, and we're planning to tape a whole lot more. So uh, go check that out. If you're new to Poker Go, use the promo code HSP to take $20 off the annual sub. Just want to put that out there for you guys, for you poker fans. And today with Ellie on the show, we're going to break down some hands we're going to relive some memories from these shows from the past but also we're going to take your questions so if you have questions for ellie we are live in four different places i'm keeping track of the chat in all these different places so if you have questions for ellie i'll make sure to try to weave them into the story we're going to watch three straight episodes of high stakes poker so sit back grab some popcorn open a beer have a cold one whatever you want to do uh, don't go anywhere because we are diving in deep ellie the first question i have for you which is obviously the one that is probably Probably the most fascinating for all of us is how did you end up on season one of high stakes poker how did you get a seat at the table in this iconic show well i tell you what it was the most amazing things you know maury maury skindadi came to our game we played you he, he was in bobby's room back then but we play over there at bellagio he walk in and he talked to it was me chip he was uh, jason laster and he was chow i believe and barry and he said guys what do you think about we want the films your show? And I remember Chip asked him, uh, what you mean? He said, you can play exactly the way you play right now. Do all the way that, you, whatever you do in a, in, a, in a game. So Doyle jump and said, can we play props? He said, you do whatever you want. I want you to, I want to do a show out of it. And not only that, I'm going to pay you. So <laughs> it was so funny. And he wanted the, the big game, which all of us, and uh, if you know, you know, we all mix specialists and none of us play only one game back then. But uh, I think for the mom and pop, it was the most important to show the, the game that, uh, you know, got the poker on the map. And uh, we asked some question and I think I would have to say within three months, he really, Mori really put everything together. And as you see, the first show, first season ever went over to Golden Nugget and I remember after playing that, and of course, you know, between Gabe Kaplan and, uh, and Maury and all the job they did, in, they did back then, uh, the different, all these old shows that you see to some of the new Poker After Dark and stuff, this show was editing, edited. So they didn't show all these boring hands. They show only the most exciting hands. And uh, I think that uh, if I'm not mistaken, Maury is going back to these things right now on his shows and uh, by the way you say season eight i was supposed to be in but i was a uh, home for like almost a year now i just got my shot so i'm happy to announce in a week and a half two weeks i'm going to start playing live and i miss live so much i play online i play a lot of mix online but 
I miss life so much. And when Mori called me two weeks ago, he said, there's another show we're doing, you know, like a month ago, he told me about the season eight. And then another poker of the dark, I told him, Mori, I waited the whole year. I'm going to wait another two weeks and then I'm going to start. And I mean, me and Mori are very good friends. So he respected and I respect him for, you know, my kids wouldn't let me walk to the house if I, you know, and I care about COVID. I was really, really good boy. And now after I got vaccinated, I'm so excited about it. I mean, back, that, that's, go, good, that's, good, that's good news. First and foremost, health is the most important thing. And uh, just for the fans and for yourself as well, you know, we are not done with high stakes poker. So hopefully we can get you on season nine. Oh, I'm coming back, I believe, very soon. Within a couple of months, I believe that we have a couple filming and I'll be there. Not only that, I know sometimes you don't like me to come with announcer in advance, but Mori told me we are going to have the old schools, boys. And that's mean the Dole Bonson, the Jennifer, the Mike Madison, the Phil Lack, the Barry Greenston, we'll have the same table. And uh, we'll, <laughs> Maury said, we're going to have Gabe Kaplan laughing how everybody got so old <laughs> and uh, how the game uh, kind of stand by or the game got better to most of you guys. And uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to go and sit down with the, you know, with the Patrick Antonios and with the, the magician and with every one of them, you know, Todd was amazing. I mean, I just loved it. I, you know, if you, I play six season. The reason I didn't play the seventh season because I was a full tilt pro and Ishai did not want a full tilt pro on the seventh season. So, and I've, I've done very well. I won five out of six season, which uh, really, really, I mean, I got to know so much. There he is. I mean, there so he is, by the way. <laughs> you're, you're just sitting down for the first time. The slick back hair, the black shirt with the button open, all cool, all casual. I mean, did, did, you, did you realize in the moment that, that this was going to be something that people would talk about for many, many years? Not, not even close. Impossible. I thought, here we go. We're getting another show. It's a poker show that probably will be filmed once, twice, probably with a repeat five times. But to get to the point that in Israel alone, they must have run it for five years, six years straight, show after show. So now when I see people and when I meet them, they start telling me, you remember the hands that you have, the six deuce heart in your hand? And, you did, and they already know all hands that I played. And of course, I gave a lot of action back then. But in this, in this particular show, I learned so much from Doyle, Doyle himself, because <laughs> Doyle, and cheap. I remember they, the first, the biggest sentence in their life was the guy that the end of the day walking with the money to the bank is that's what count. Not the guy that bluff big and get cut. I mean, talking about uh, Brad Booth. If Brad Booth would ever get cut in this particular end, I mean, it'll be the, you know, they'll, those days Phil will never fall this end to the million dollar bet. But uh, I'm saying, those are the, the, I mean, what I learned from him that a lot of newcomers come to the game and they try to play, a, basically make a hero bluff or hero call. And I, I keep looking at Doyle and Doyle play the regular ABC game and, you know, move here and move there. And it did work. It, it, it's cool and, and funny when you think back of it, because I mean, I've watched all seven seasons multiple times. Doyle is probably the only player who won every single season with the exception, I believe, of the year, uh, of the final year that he played. I think he lost very small. But it is funny because Doyle plays very straightforward. Um, there's the iconic hand between Doyle and Guy La Liberté um, where Guy has just one pair, Doyle has top two, and he just collects an 800k pot just like it's nothing. Uh, so yes, there's a lot of merit to playing that ABC style. I just want to address everyone in the chat right now. I see uh, Lance, Jonathan, Chris, M Miguel, Eric, Dan, on Facebook. I see lots of people on YouTube. I see Barlight Broker chiming in on our High Stakes Poker YouTube channel. Appreciate you uh, as well. We're also live on Twitch and on the PokerGo YouTube channel. So we have tons of action going on here. You guys, please keep those questions coming. I'm keeping track of those to ask them uh, to Ellie as they come through uh, on the show. Uh, one of the questions from Eric on Facebook says, how was it playing with Doyle Brunson? And I'll make the question a little bit bigger. When did you first play with Doyle and how did your relationship evolve over time? Wow, that's, that's a very good question because when Doyle and Chip realized there's a businessman 
all of a sudden come and join in the game. And when we move from the Mirage, you know, I've been playing 30 years poker. I would say from 1995, I start playing a little more higher, 500,000 and one and 2,000. So from when we moved to, from the Mirage to the Bellagio, uh, the original people in the game were me and Doyle and Chip and Barry and, and uh, I think Phil Ivey just joined the game. I even remember right there, Daniel Nagano was sweating Jennifer. Daniel wasn't a, a name back then. And I remember him, to this day we're talking about it, I remember Daniel telling me, I mean, he basically licking his lips like that when he see us and he said, wow, those guys playing the big game. And he realized the big game is a lot looser than what people think. You know, people think, oh, those guys are so tight and the big game is so, no, the big game was very juicy. And uh, I remember that Phil, I mean, the Chip, basically he played as my friend back then when we start. And he keep calling me, he said, Eli, we need to start the game and we need to start, call Doyle. Many times he asked me to call Doyle. He didn't want to call Doyle himself. And that's how the, relation start, the relationship began. And of course I knew that he called me because I was the one without experience. I'm the businessman and I'm the fish. And it took me time because I play with this couples for so many hands and I learned so much for them and you know believe it or not I've done very well when I play three-handed four-handed with Chip and Doyle and um, from this year forward we become after that like I would say three years down the road 2001 2002 when I play two and four thousand three and six thousand four and eight with Doyle we become more friends you know we I've been invited to all the Christmas parties I knew Louis very good, his wife. I knew Chip's wife and his kids. And we did some, we played some Chinese games in their houses sometimes. And he was a lot more than a poker player later on in life. But uh, I even travel. I travel with them. I travel with the, to Tunica a couple of times. I travel to, uh, uh, to Reno. And I traveled to, we took a few times private jets and we flew some places that, uh, you know, Jack Binion wants us to play and stuff like that. And that's how we become friends. Now, of course, I didn't win at the beginning. It took me time, you know. The lesson was very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to this, uh, you know, before the high stakes poker, I don't know if you remember this poker superstars. Yeah. So I do. poker superstar was before, that's what Maury started us with. And that was the point system with the late, uh, you know, I mean, um, it was like sit and goes, sit, like sit and goes, right? Yes, sit and goes. And then, and, and I've seen the first time in my life Gus doing some stuff that I never see before, you know. And those sit and goes was interesting, but that's what I thought about when we started Ice Tex. I thought, oh, we're probably going to have the same thing, you know, it'll be like, Poker superstar, they'll film it. I mean, they'll run it once or twice and that's it. But never in my life I believe that uh, that will capture every mom and pop, every house, showing late night, showing during the day. And I mean, you become an, a name, you know? What was it like when this started airing on TV? What was it like to walk through the Bellagio and all of a sudden people were stopping you for pictures and, and autographs because I, it, it must have been a strange day when you realize like, w hold on, wait a minute. Uh, th this is not just a poker game anymore. People are actually fans of, of me and fans of the game and fans of Doyle. What was it like for you when you realized that? I mean, I think it went completely nuts, you know, because to these days I tell people I'm only a card player. I'm not a superstar. I'm not a mad damn I'm not a Leonardo, it just, he went completely like to, to, to take picture with everyone and to give signatures. And of course, later on, we find out they're selling it on YouTube and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I didn't, I did not understand how did he blow up so much. And then I start to realize, and I remember giving some interviews in uh, NBC and in ABC that we did the uh, ABC uh, international tournaments and stuff like that. I, I remember telling people that I just realized that everyone, it doesn't matter if you're fat, it doesn't matter if you're old, it doesn't matter if you're young, can play poker and can play good poker if you put the hours. 
not many people can go and play the golf and not many people can play basketball. So I realized so many households, I mean, I didn't know that until I got to Israel probably uh, about three or four times that I get so many people ask me to play private game, can't go to their houses. And I had, I never go play private. I mean, I decided I don't want to, I mean, we have casinos and everything, and I never play any of those private games, you know, and actually not never because Gabe Kaplan and, um, invited me to Beverly Hills, and I played there with Gabe and with uh, Toby Maguire and with uh, Leonardo I played there with, and then after the third or fourth time, they gave me the, they, they <laughs> sent me away, you know, when I need to, when I cash few good times. They told me, no, we don't want any pros over here. But that was my only private game, basically. I mean, I did some charity event in houses for the IDF, the Israeli defense, but I never actually, I prefer to be in a casino where the cam cameras is, when they, the rules are standing and you don't have to play with your fingers, you know? Right. So I stuck to the casino and then to those shows, of course. First hand that you, you you ever played on on uh, high stakes poker, Ace King suited against uh, Shiki. Uh, you make top pair. He gets the nut flush draw. Do you do you remember this moment? Be honest, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've just seen. I mean, Shiki was a wild player, you know. And uh, I don't know if he make his flush, but if he make a flush, I probably paid him off. Let me see. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Eating, eating, a, eating a carrot, by the way. The diet was already starting back then, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I saw your uh, episode with, uh, with Daniel Nagano about the food. And I realized that was uh, back then already that when I play... Uh, well, let's see, let's see what he does to me. Yeah, I'm curious. And it's funny, too, for the people at home. There were no bet sizes on the it's screen. Like 30,000 were... right there. Wow. I bet nine? Make it 30. Wow. Let's listen. Let's listen to what Gabe has to say. He was all loud and chirping. Now you're not <laughs> the whole the table was shaking. Now he's all right. Now the table is not shaking. Anymore. What Daniel's doing here is, is really wrong, and Daniel ordinarily oh, wouldn't do this. He's kind of saying, I think Sean has a big hand, and Sean has aggravated him. That's why he couldn't control like himself. I don't think you have anything on the flap. <laughs> and the spade getting there. <laughs> oh, Daniel says something. Wow. Yeah, he was getting involved. Let's see what the reaction is going to be, depending on what happens on the turn here. What did he raise me? I think he raised me about 20, 24 or something. Yeah, I think so. It looked like 30 in front of him. A I don't think Ellie needed Daniel's help. He realizes that something's going on in this hand. Ellie is a top player. Look at wow. this. Wow, measure falls. Chance we had some peace and quiet. Yeah, the only time we can get peace and quiet is when Sean has the nuts. Right? Let's see one card on this. <laughs> one card, one card. Oh, if he could have got stuck, Rob, I had to be well, quiet. Can I give one to myself? Yeah, that's a great fold. That's great. Um, uh, one of the questions I see a lot is, was high stakes poker a good representation of, of how the game was? And of course, it was mixed games and not hold them. But was it a good representation of what the game was like when there was no cameras? Uh, not really, because I think that we were a lot more open on when we played the mixed games without cameras. But the ice sticks, when we got the cameras on, uh, I mean, I remember so many moments. I mean, this man right there, Sammy, Sammy basically between him and Tom Duan and Daniel, I mean, without those guys, the show is not even, uh, it's not even close to have a good show. And Sammy came from this PLO, and he played mostly PLO back then. And he loved to muscles, you know, and he, he was a very good reader, he read people. And I remember, you know, doing my homework, meaning uh, after every season, I was literally sitting home the way you, did, you said, and I run the tape and run it again and run the tape and run it again. And I tried to pick up some stuff on Sammy, which I did, I believe. I tried to pick up some stuff on Tom Duan, which I didn't. <laughs> Tom Duan was Tom Duan basically make me and Doyle talking on a break we were sitting on a break and we tried to you know to come where this Tom to, to operate on Tom ends and what he's doing and he was the, the newcomer before they even knew what is GTO before they even knew 
Tom came to, the, to our game and he did some stuff. I even said that in many, many interviews that because Tom Duan, there is hundreds of thousands of players, young players, from the 20th to the 28th or whatever, that, wanted, that Tom Duan wanna be, and they borrow money and they took money and they tried to do what he did, you know, with his slow motion <laughs> bedding and all those things and a lot of disappointing people because what Tom have, nobody have. And matter of fact, I just now saw yesterday the third episode of season eight, you know, I run it and buddy is still there. It's not the Tom Duan that will push everything. Now I see a little more careful, but he's a good player. He's, I mean, I'll take my hat for him. You know, he's really, he's not the old school type. I mean, Jennifer and Mike Madison and, and, and Doyle and, and Barry, those are the old school. I mean, what I mean old school, if you, I don't know if, I, if you were there, but recently, I saw a picture of you 10 years ago, how fat you were. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> and back then, and not 10 years ago, I would say it would be 1993, 94, 95. The old school people, that I remember there was a bet, raise, three bet, all in. There was never four bet, five bet, all these things that we see today, or the mini raise and stuff like that. We never even in in, uh, in this game, in the in the high stakes, we never mini raise. You know, if we play the game 500,000, the next uh, semi come in for 7,000, you know? <laughs> or it's it was never the, I call it the, the Jason Marcia uh, 2000. You know, he all is, the first time I ever see people raise double was with Jason. I sit with him in a tournament and I see it and I said to myself, shit, this is good for me, you know? I'm gonna, I, it's so cheap to call a lot of, you know, raises like that with a suited connected. And if you hit the flap, if you know how to let it go on the flap. But in high stakes, I I mean, I've seen some stuff on Daniel. I mean, for me, Daniel is one of the best players till today. And I don't care what's happened to him. And I don't care that he lost to Doug and what's happened. You know, I remember Doyle tweet right when they decided to start. Doyle said, I will never. If they telling me that I'm a dog, and everyone's willing to lay three and four to one on him, on Doug, he said, I will never play. They can come and play my game. The Raz will play even money, but I'll never play. And Daniel is competitive, you know, he's a big one and he decided to play it. And I heard what he said in your show that he, he learned so much. And, um, but back then, I mean, the most amazing things everybody even telling me about Daniel was, Daniel was reading the player's hand. He said, I know what you got. He called his hand and he still go call all in. Yep. And I bet you if we can count it, we can count at least 10 times that he blew up another 100,000 or another 150 or 200 on the river when he called his opponent hand and he still called. He did it to me at least three, three or four times when I have the nuts. And why? Because my face, because I'm, you know, I show some bluffs and I, I did show some bluffs, you know, I did play aggressive, but for him to call your hand and still not folding, that was one of the things that poker, uh, I mean, I don't know if uh, Gabe talked about it this season, but Daniel was amazing with those, you know? Absolutely. And Daniel also sat down with a million dollars on the first season of High Stakes Poker, which made it even more iconic. And he's wearing this bright blue button-up shirt, which basically blinds your eyes when you look at it. Um, just want to give a quick shout to everyone watching. Yes, Ellie and I are live. We are taking your questions. We are watching season one of High Stakes Poker, Sammy Farr in the mix with the unlit cigarette. We have Daniel with the shiny glasses. We have Jennifer Harmon wearing a leather jacket. This is like a time capsule. This is like the ultimate time machine. When I am 80 years old, I will still watch this to get that feeling back of what it was like when I started playing poker because the High Stakes Poker Season 1 came out when I had just started playing poker and Jamie Gold had won, just won the main event. So obviously, this is nostalgia for every poker fan out there and I'm so glad you guys are all joining. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to all our channels. I'm doing this show, by the way, every single week on Thursday at 5 p.m. Um, I have, I have, oh, I wish I could say the name. Ellie, I'll tell you after the show. I have such a special, I have such a special guest coming up. I don't want to say it just yet, but it's also historic. And Ellie, it, when I say the name to Ellie, he'd be like, "Wow, really? That's how special it is. That's going to happen." So you guys stay tuned for that. We have more questions coming. Like I said, don't forget to like this video. We're here for 
three full episodes. Ellie, what I want to ask of you, you've seen so many players come and go. You've mentioned Tom Dwan, you've mentioned Chip and Doyle and, and Daniel Negreanu. You've also played Jason Mercer, of course, guys like younger guys, Antonius Jungleman. Who do you think over all those years were the most talented, the most gifted players that you've played against? Maybe they didn't succeed. Maybe they are out of the game. But who did you see and play against that you were like, wow, these guys have something special? I mean, I know it will sound like a broken record, but when Phil Ivey said that the very first time in our cash game, the big game in Bellagio, I remember uh, when he got up and go, I think he booked a nice 600,000 win. I remember Chip leaning to me and said, this guy is going to be the best player in the world. I said, why? How do you say that? He said, he got something that only Stu Hunger got. Only, you know, people that you can tell that they playing from the gut, like our old school people. That stuff that you don't need the mathematical head for it, you know? You don't need to read book for it. You got the feeling. And he said, this guy is feeling it. And you know what? I learned it. I learned the lesson on my bankroll several times with him. And yes, like if I get intim intimidated with a player, it would definitely be feel, you know. Of course, those days when I see the high high roller and I saw all those very, very solid players, I probably wouldn't sit down on those games. I mean, you would say, yeah, but you cannot say that. I'll play tournament, you know. I'm a mixed game player. I play anyone. I don't care if it's Phil or anyone. Sit with me and put the 10 games on. I'll play anyone, and I believe I can beat anyone, including the no limit and the pot limit, no limit, all them and pot limit. But play the one game. You know, I haven't watched any of the Doug Pock and Daniel Negrano match, but uh, I've seen some of those high rollers, the one that you do your homework with, and, you know, everybody do it on Poker Go. And I've seen stuff that uh, they just better, you know, and I don't want to play with someone to be a dog. I don't want to, you know, be guessing all the time. So, I mean, even now, those days when I see the Rick Salmon on eight season, the eight season, wow. I mean, this guy is one of the toughest guy to play poker with, you know, and, and you know what? I'll compare. Yes, Rick, very much comparing to Dur, you know, to Tom Duan, because he, he doesn't, he does not have regret for money. And if he believes that he can get you out of middle pair, he'll put the $200,000 with nothing. And seeing stuff like that is just telling me where I'm belonging and when I belong, you know. So, yes, you'll see the Eli Eleza many years to come. I mean, people keep saying, and Doyle saying that the last time we talked about the Hall of Fame, he said, I won't tell you who I'm going to vote for, but the guy is from Israel. You know, <laughs> Doyle knows that I put more hours than anybody. I just love the game. If you're asking me, I got every player phone number in my phone. When we're starting a game, of course, before the pandemic, I mean, everyone texts me and coming and we have the games going. And of course, I went down all the way from the four and eight thousand to the three, six thousand, down all the way to four and eight hundred and three and six hundred. And you know what? I'm doing well there and I'm happy there. They definitely now on the four and eight thousand, you have the Brian Russ and Scott Siever and all the good, good players, you know, with John, Johnny Ward. I just you have to know sometimes who you can beat, you know. So when I play the lower game, I can definitely, you know, will come up with a sentence. If you sit down in a game and you don't see the fish, then it's you, you know. So, I mean, I learned, I got some experience in the, with all the mistakes I make during my life, you know, with bankroll, going broke several times, you know. I'm not a businessman anymore, you know. Right now, I'm a, that's all what I do. I play poker right. for the last eight or nine years and... I just love it. And that's the reason I wanted to join and jump in and poker after dark and I stakes pokers and play against with Doyle. And uh, hopefully we'll get every one of those players. Matter of fact, I told Mori, I'm going to get Sammy in here. I do something. I can get his number and I try to get him in our uh, show, you know, because that will be a hell of a homecoming, you know? I mean, you, you, <laughs> you would not believe how many comments on our YouTube videos are about Sammy and he just became 
a larger than life character on those high stakes po I mean even right now looking at him like of course he finished second to Chris Moneymaker in 03 and, and then on high stakes poker he became uh, the legend that he is and it would be amazing if, if you guys could like bring the band back together for uh, a season of high stakes poker that would be that would be incredible um we're getting some questions on multiple platforms and and, and i'm curious myself as well um oh, oh by the way let me not forget to mention if you want to know more about ellie's life story google ellie Lesser book and you'll find pulling the trigger the bi biography about ellie Lesser, the whole story which we do not have time today to tell the whole story so we're going to try to pick and choose but i just just want to recommend it's an it's an incredible book it's available in English and in Hebrew, maybe even more languages by now, but it's definitely in English and Hebrew. Matan Krakow did an amazing job with that. Um, and, and, and just, it's just very and Robbie, exciting. And Robbie, Robbie, and, and, Robbie did, <laughs> and Robbie did the English version, of course, I have to say. Because I remember back in 2011 in WSFP Europe in Cannes, me and Matan had lunch and we talked about it for like three hours. It was, it was great. And I'm, I'm so happy that the book is available. And um, just like how many other poker players have their life story out there, uh, I can highly recommend uh, Ellie's book. So go check that out. My question then, Ellie, for the people who are watching right now is how did you go from Israel to all of a sudden being in the in the biggest games in the world. There's a lot of steps in between, obviously, but, but please give the fans sort of the short version of that because um, there there's a lot of there's a lot of story uh, involved in all those steps. Well, I'll do it pretty short. Born up in Jerusalem, Israel, going to the army when I was 18 in 1978, serving and become an officer also in uh, 1979 or 80. Uh, in 81, 82, the Lebanon war started and I was an officer and I got wounded. And uh, remember, I remember, you know, in my group, like the Green Beret over here, it's called the Golani Brigade. I remember one of the officers talking about Alaska. You can make a lot of money in Alaska. And I'm, you know, my, my parents are average parents. My mom is a kindergarten teacher and my dad is a post office employee. And uh, I remember that the guy said, you can make so much money on the cannery in a, in a fish so in Alaska. So when I got wounded, I couldn't be anymore in, on my group. So I decided to take a leave for six months and check it out. I was with the cast. The cast got out of my leg for three months later. So three months, I flew to Alaska. And uh, right there, learning uh, English as a second language, you can tell until now I cannot lose my accent. So... Right there, I um, got introduced by the teacher that teach me English as a second language about a small Alaska Inupak village, which is Eskimo village in uh, 30 miles above the Arctic Circle called Katsibiu. And I went over there after a walk in the cannery. And over there, I started driving a taxi. And in the weekend, some of those taxi drivers, after about six months that I'm driving, they playing poker. So they invite me and I, of course I went to play because I knew a little poker before. I never play in the army like people thought I did, but right before I had the army in high school. And uh, when I go play, they introduced me for the first time for Stad and Omaha and all those old pot limit because I thought, you know, it's only one game. I mean, to make the long story short, every weekend I made a lot of money playing those guys. And of course there wasn't a good the good players. And then I decided, you know, I stayed there for about two years in Alaska. Every two, three months, I took a trip to Vegas. So making this money, flying to Vegas, they clean me out. I get <laughs> in, I get to Stardust, and I go back with nothing. Then I realized I might be a good player over here with those players. But so getting to, I mean, my partner, my brother-in-law arrived to Alaska. A year later, he said, I'm done with you know, six month dark, six month light. And he flew to Vegas and from Vegas, he was going to go to Disney, Disneyland. And then he called me, he said, listen, there's a film develop a lab for sale. He didn't have to say it twice. I flew down. We bought this film developed in 30 minutes. And uh, it, six months later, I left Alaska. I arrived over here and I, the film's developed shop was right in front of Stardust. So every break I go to Stardust, I play every time. And I start falling in love with the game. Of course, I start like anybody else, you know, 5, 10, 10, 20, you know, 20, 40, and playing only small limit game. And then later on, when we move from Stardust, I moved to the Mirage, I start playing some no limit games and the mix games. 
And only then I become, you know, I, I just loved it so much. I still was in business, but I realized so much money that I make in business, I lose, you know, to the poker player. And uh, of course, uh, I'm not a good reader in English, so I never read any book. But I did everything watching other people, you know, I did everything learning from my top players and uh, and uh, the stories with Chip, the stories with Chip and Doyle and the story with this. Right there when I start playing theirs, I already was a winner player. You know, I start making money and uh, I remember the biggest question every fan asked me, you playing your own money. I mean, everyone thinking this is impossible that you bet $150,000 with nothing or Sammy Fahadou, this kind of bluff or Daniel Cole with full house over quad for million, you know, and some people don't believe it. And I love what, what Gabe Kaplan do on this show. He said, you know, in a, in a rerun of the show, he said, they playing their own money. He's saying it, he's saying it at the beginning of the show. And uh, so that's how I've become a poker player. All right. So if you want more of that story, page by page, check out the book. I just want to mention that one more time for everyone who's just chiming in. I'll be keeping track of these questions that are coming in. I think we've covered quite a few already. Uh, thanks, everyone, so much for chiming in. Too many names to shout out on tonight's show. We have too many viewers. I'm sorry. I, I'm not going to go through the shout outs today, but I do appreciate everyone chiming in on YouTube, on Twitch and on Facebook. We are still live. Keep those uh, questions coming. I'll try to get them in as much as possible. Um, one question that I saw coming in earlier on Facebook is, um, Ellie, what was, the, what was the worst day of, you, of, you, of your life as a poker player where you went home and you were driving maybe on a hot day with the window open thinking like, what, what happened today? I cannot believe it. Do you have a memory of, of, of one of those days? Well, I, I'll, I'll give you two of them. One of them, it was the less pain, I would say, Jack Binion come to me and uh, Doyle and Chip and said, guys, I just opened Tunica, the horseshoe in Tunica, and I'm getting the biggest tournament over there. And I want you to come. I'm going to send you the jet. And I want you to come. And I want you to bring Eli and this and bring those play. You know, they all call me Eli back then. So, and Doyle call me Eli until now. So anyway, of course we went. And then Chip said, let's go two days before, you know, we just play some cash games and we he giving us our own room and everything. Okay, you know, private jet, you're going two days before, you drink on the plane, everything is beautiful, you're landing. I remember landing, I would say around 6 p.m. We go straight to the, got our room and go straight to the table. And we play, for some reason, I played Bellagio, only two and four, three and six thousand. For some reason, Lyle convinced me to play four and eight thousand. I would say by 1 a.m. or two, like eight hours later, I was down five hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which was the biggest loss I ever had before. And and my wife was, you know, my wife always sitting behind me and stuff. And everybody quit. Everybody quit. The next day is the tournament, you know, and. <laughs> The chief said to me, are you going to play tournament? I said, listen, I need to win first prize to be able to break even. So I remember going upstairs to the room and drinking wine and taking his pills and just to try to get this memory out. So this one is okay because it's the biggest losses. The second, the, the other one was, I remember playing say, um, in Bellagio, playing for 36 hours straight and losing... 1.38. Mm. I play so bad. I call every hand and I don't have to tell you. I was overweight. I never did this. I was eating at a table, a midnight steak and lobsters. I, I falling asleep on the table. Anyway, 1.3 million. And then finally my wife called and she said, I don't care. I'm going to go myself if you're not getting up. So I get, got up from the table. I left. I it was supposed to drive, go to valet driving and open my windows, you know, with the heat. And she stayed with me on the phone to make sure I'm not falling asleep while driving. But yes, I was talking myself, talking to myself on the mirror. I said, why do I need it? Why does, do I need this life changing money? I mean, my parents didn't make 1.3 million for all their life, you know? And uh, I think that like every other pop poker player, we are human. We forget real fast about the pain and 
we leave you know a few months later we we go back to the <laughs> same shit again you know but yeah that, those are two bad days that i remember it's kind of funny i mean i play small stakes but you remember the losses so much more than the best days where you're crushing everyone do you do you even have a memory of a good day oh, yeah i have i mean with this man right here with oh, sammy faha yes perfect I, I have with Semi one of my best day. I won 1.85 million 850. We play a no limit hold them PLO stud stud eight or better all your game dues to seven. And uh, Semi was on a train. You know he was steaming his ass. And all what you have to do is play regular. And once you flop something, you check to him. He bet you raise real fast and he go all in 200,000 cup. I think I won like uh, at least six, seven cups like that, you know? And um, I remember the, basically I have all the chips in the table. I play with Sammy, Ted Forrest, Johnny Ward. Johnny even remember these days. Uh, Jennifer left after a little bit because her husband, Marco took her, her ex-husband took her from there. And I think it was Chow, I was the only winner. And believe me, those days, and some of your fans will agree with me, you think that you're untouchable. You are the best player in the world. Nobody can play like you, you know? 1.85 million. You understand how much chips I have in my, in my box? And, <laughs> but yes, I think Sammy lost 800, wow. 700,000 of it, you know? Because, Sam, and you know, Sammy can sit many hours. I mean, it was Sammy and Gus Hanson and Chow Chang. Those are the three people that I never, maybe Bobby Baldwin, Never see anybody playing more hours in live poker than those people and smoking and going back. Dari, Gus didn't smoke, but the rest of them smoking, smoking. I mean, I am the old school that smoking was allowed in the table and we play with our fan. I don't know about <laughs> you, Ramco. <laughs> I'm too young, but I, I've seen the photos of the, the 1995 main event final table with Dan Harrington. Dan Harrington has a small fan pointing away from him in both directions because they're both smoking on the other side. That was that was the, the old school ways when you were still allowed to smoke at the table. I mean, these stories are simply incredible and it, it's, it's just so crazy to hear. And I live in Las Vegas now, so you know, whenever, and of course, because of the pandemic, I have not been on the strip in almost a year. Um, it's just still, as a poker fan, crazy to walk into Bellagio to see Bobby's room or walk into the aria where where they have the big games going on as well and to see all those guys just put it out there time and time again every day grinding 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 it's just so crazy um and you've been away from the games for almost a year now and you're just so excited to uh, to get back into the mix um you mentioned yeah. earlier that you're gonna you're gonna just always keep playing you're more of a poker player now does that mean that you know once it's possible again full-time grinding absolutely i mean how many people you see? I mean, Robbie is the one that brought it to my attention. I won three bracelets after I was 50. You know, of course, the stud bracelet. You know, I'm a good stud player and I love stud. But yes, I love grinding the WSOP. I mean, I would I wish they'll move to Caesar. And I believe and I want to believe that we'll have it this year. I don't think we'll have it in May and June, but I, maybe they'll do it in September. I just hope that, you know, World Series of Poker or WPT or any, any of those things will do what Mori does. You know, you have to come, you have a nurse right there, you have to be tested. And on top of it, you know, in Israel, for example, right now, over four and a half million are gonna be vaccinated already. And you know what, you cannot go to a show. I hope that WSOP will pick it up, come with a green passport, show us that you've been vaccinated twice, you can buy for the $1,500 tournament. For me and for a lot of old people that love poker, it will help me. It will help me to understand that, I know they're probably gonna still have the mask on, you know? In the shows I understand for Mori that we do the rapid test real quick, we don't have to do the mask now, but it's gonna be a, a very good feeling for everybody, I mean, COVID, prove himself that he's here to beat us. When I got vaccinated now, and you know, the Pfizer is 95%, you tell me as a poker player, or show me any poker player, we are number of people. If I have a 95%, I'm going all in any day, any, right? So, I mean, I'm going out there, I'm gonna play, I know all the rules about I can get it and pass it to other people, but uh, 
if Biden will do what he says he's going to do and we're going to get by the end of the summer most of the population, that will make a lot of people happy. And I hope in our sport, you know, poker player, if they will be smart enough not to say like a lot of uh, people that against vaccinating, you know, because you don't have enough study and stuff. If poker player will be smart enough and all of us will convince a lot of people, we'll be in really good shape. Absolutely. Um, a lot more questions coming in. I'll tackle some of those right now. Uh, for people who are just tuning in, Ellie and I are live right now watching season one of High Stakes Poker. This is over 15 years ago. This is almost 16 years ago that this was being taped, which is just so crazy to think about. Um, seven seasons have happened. Season eight is now available on Poker Go. If you are new to our platform, use the promo code HSP to take $20 off the annual sub. And then it comes down to about $7 a month and you get to watch every single thing in the archives. You can watch new episodes of Poker After Dark and High Stakes Poker once a week, Monday and Wednesday. And we spend the entire year of 2020 without live poker, most of it. And what we did in that year was digitize all the old World Series of Poker final tables. From 2003 all the way up until 2019, every single preliminary event that was ever shown on TV, so don't, we're talking TV episodes, are now available on Poker Go, and we are working on digitizing some of the old VHS tapes that we found of 1978 and 1991 and 1993. I'm curating that library, and we'll have that on Poker Go later this year. Let so, me tell the audience some other stuff about Poker Go that... It was very amazing for me too. Just to watch some pieces that they put on, on Chip Rees, on, the, on, the, on the Re, Eric Seidel, on the Stu Unger, it's just amazing. Stuff that I didn't know myself about those people. And they give you a 20 minutes to 40 minutes, or sometimes it's a series about those players, about the day-to-day, -day, you know, even the Phil Almut. And it just, you guys have to log into this poker go because uh, it's just amazing. It's good for our thing. It's the ESPN of the poker player, and you guys should support. I, I, I appreciate that a lot, Ellie. And, and what Ellie is referencing is the Pokerography series, where we have documentary style uh, insights into the lives of people like Eric Seidel, also some newer age players like Jason Kuhn. And we have the Super High Roller Club, which has some really funny insights. And we have Legends of the Game, where we have a special episode on Stu Unger and one on Chip Reese and one on the history of poker and how poker started way back in the 1500s. Um, Ellie wasn't even around back then. That's how long ago it is. It's a very long time ago. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's a very good story. Um, the, the Sammy Farha story was fascinating. And people are asking about all these characters that you used to play with. Um, what I'm also curious with is Andy Beal. Let me tell you something about Sammy Farha because okay. we go to the next one. NBC, heads up. We've been invited, then NBC come and film some of the stuff and they go to Bobby's room and they get Sammy in the side, they get me and they said, guys, we want to talk a little bit about politics, about Israel, Lebanon. And Sammy said, listen, that's it. I don't want you to do anything. Please don't put my name out there. I, I said to him, Sammy, we can bring, you know, Freddie Deeb always said it. We can bring peace through poker. You know, the, he said, you don't understand. If they'll know I talk to you as an Israeli commander and it's not going to be good for me if I land in Lebanon. So I let it go and we never talk about that again, you know. And the guy from NBC understood it too. Wow. That, that, that's, actually, that's actually an angle that I hadn't considered. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, lots, that's also the beauty, right? The, the colorfulness of all these characters, Lebanon, Israel, uh, Mori is from Iran, as Antonio is from Iran. Th that whole blend, you have the Scandinavians with Gus and Patrick and, you know, the, the UK guys like Devilfish. There's just people from all walks of life coming together in this game that make it into such a spectacle. And, and we all have someone to root for, maybe not from your country, but maybe from, you know, a, a certain style that you appreciate. I think that's, that's just a beautiful thing. Um, the next player that I want to ask you about is, is the famous story of, of the corporation versus Andy Beal. The beautiful book, the the professor, the banker, and the suicide king, which everybody should read. Um, how close were you to that, and, and and what are some of the memories of that era? Well, I I think I joined a little late, and it's a, another reason is because I didn't have the bankroll to join the guys, and the, the corporation was five hundred thousand a piece. You know, the 20 of, 20 of them they got twenty million. I joined, I think after the fourth or fifth, I play. I I was. I, I got pretty good profit, you know, I think I make quite a bit too, but uh, $500,000 $500, each. 
with the very first time I joined the cooperation, you know, and somebody introduced me to Andy and, um, and I saw this guy, very intelligent, you know, coming and trying to play the best players in the world. And at the beginning, by the way, I don't know if you know the story, he played he, he play a full table. It was 10 and 20,000. You know, he, he got to the poker room and said, I'm looking to play higher than what you guys playing. And they sent him to Bob Israel and said, no, they playing four and eight. So no, no, a lot higher. So I think one of the guys, I think a doctor came to Doyle and told Doyle, and Doyle didn't believe it, but he go outside and the guy told him, I want to play. So I think that it was a 10 and 20,000. And basically the game was almost full and they realized, then he realized that in full game, he probably have no shot. So then he wanted to play shorthanded and heads up. And I remember Ted Forrest, they play heads up and they play 20, 40,000. Ted went to his box and get about $3 million and sat down in the game. And after he sat down with his own money, the corporation told him, come on, Ted, we need to. So I think the first, the first time I joined was after the third time when they beat him for about, I would say 10 million or 15. Uh, and he came and he came to the Bellagio and each of us put 500,000 and he beat us for the $10 million. Now I was there and not only he beat us, he asked Doyle and me, we were playing our side game while watching, you know, and they, they were tag team. You know, Phil Ivey was in the end, but at the beginning there was anybody that feel like he's a good limit for all the player. I know Todd and Jennifer and that play, but everyone playing and he was up and he beat us for $10 million. Now, I think that was the time that Gus played him and they said, Gus is not going to play him anymore <laughs> because you cannot play. So he called every one of us and me, I still have the picture, I think. Doyle got it. He said he got it. Me, Doug Dalton, Doyle, uh, Jennifer and Andy, picture with, he got $10 million in flags in front of him. Anyway, he said he had to go, so he went to Texas, and then the, it didn't take long. Two weeks later, he came, we put the money together again. We beat him, then we put the money together again, and we sent, this time he said, I don't want to play in the Bellagio, it's too lucky, too unlucky, I want to go to the win. You know, he can sign any amount of money, any marker he want. So, he went and I remember they told me I was the captain, me and David Gray. So I went and collect the money from everybody, you know, every one of those corporations, it's all the top players. And I went to Phil Ivey and Phil, uh, you know, at the win and Phil lost, I think Phil lost the first seven or eight million. And he told us, guys, it's okay. I know everything gonna be go, go get more. So we went and collect another 10 million. We went back to Phil, we gave it to him and Phil beat him for about 37 million straight. And we were sitting there, me and David Gray and stuff. And I remember when he, he couldn't take it anymore. I think it was about, he raised the limit from 1,500,000 to 100, 200,000. I remember that he said, okay, I'm done. He shake my hand and said, I don't see you guys anymore. And he said it many times like that. And uh, then we called the security and now we're supposed to go with $37 million back to Bellagio. <laughs> and it was those chocolate chips, you know, the $25,000 chips. And I even wrote it in my book. We, I remember David Levy helped me. They gave us a limo and they gave us a security guard with a shotgun. Oh my God. And we, drove, we drove and I called the guys on the way and I give every one of them their share. Each of us make 1.7 or 1.8 million or whatever. And those are the days that the box was full all the time, you know? I mean, it seems like like the full tilt days, that money was growing on the trees, you know? You put your full tilt patch and you pour and you got so much money, every one of them. So those was the days, you know? <laughs> it's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, I never even thought about playing him because I'm not a good limit holder players. Right, so you never played, but you were basically organizing and helping out organizing and part of the corporation yeah right wow it's incredible um i keep this this sounds like a library episode i keep recommending books once again read ellie's book but also read professor banker and a suicide king incredible book a fascinating story to read um i read it multiple times it's it's great um Next, next topic I want to get into, and you mentioned it already, is the full tilt poker era. When, when online poker started coming up in, in the era after Moneymaker won the main event, obviously there was 
Planet Poker and Paradise Poker before Moneymaker won. And PokerStars was also around, but it was all much, much smaller. But then, of course, it was the big online poker boom. How did you... How did you see online poker as it was growing? And, and, and did you realize that, you know, this was going to get as big as it did? Yeah, I think that the very first time Chip introduced me to Island Poker, Highland Poker. And he said, I know the owner and I know this is a software and everything. And he said, get home, log in. I logged in and we start playing online. That was the very first time in my life playing online. And, you know, it's fun. You're playing in your pajamas. And, uh, and then I realized that it's fun, but it's fast, you know? So what we did, because there wasn't a big game, we played 10 times, you know? So if we play like, a, you know, 10, 20, we play 100, 200 or whatever. Between ourselves, we set the later. And then later on, Paradise came and then Poker Stars. And I mean, when Full Tilt came, I still remember that uh, David Gray buy a piece and Do uh, um, Howard came to the game and he showed me the, the full tilt logo. And I said, what's that? He said, that's our name going to be. And that's, I'm talking about two years before, year and a half before. And then slowly, slowly, I see that John Juanda and Eric Seidel and the Phil Ivy and the Gs and everybody joining. So one day I remember he came, I would say about a, nine months before full tilt even go on air. And he collected some investors' money. I think David Gray took money. And then I, I said to Lyle, you know, I was sitting next to Lyle, and Lyle said, don't even think about it. We cannot. I said, what are you talking about? He said, Eli, you have a gaming license. I have a gaming license for, you know, some of those slots machine in a in gas station that I have and a liquor license. He said, and, you know, Lyle got the casino license, the lake into them. And he said, if they're going to catch that we have a piece of... In, a, you know, an illegal company or whatever. It wasn't a gray area, if you remember. It's not good for us. And to these days, I swear at Lyle and I said, fuck, man, <laughs> excuse me. I said, if he wouldn't say nothing, I mean, those guys made more, way more than anybody else in a, do, during those days. I even got late to be jumping to be a full tilt, uh, you know, pro. He took me on. Only when I flew into Melbourne the first time, me and our good friend, we were friends to these days, and I talked to him. I said, why don't you put me? I'm from Israel. You know, you'll have some audience that, and him and Ray decided to let me in, you know, and it was pretty sweet, you know. The, the amount of money was pretty sweet. They staking when you don't have money. They, everything was good, you know, especially when we start the game, the full tilt, and you know, I didn't play. When I play PLO, when Zygmunt sent me home sometime crying, and, you know, in PLO, he beat me for so much money, and, and Antonio's, and I said to myself, what do I do wrong? I'm waiting for aces, you know? I've been waiting for aces, and then when I get aces, I raise him, re -raise, re -raise him he moved me all in with a 9-10 Jack Queen double suited, which I didn't know back then that it's almost even money, you know, when you have bad aces. So then, all of a sudden, they come up with a mixed game. And that was the happiest day in my life. Because I remember, I would say two years into Phil Tilt, I was, I remember calling Howard and stuff. I was up $5.7 million in mixed game and down, I would say, $2 million in the other game. So having the mixed game and having Tom Duan jumping and playing stud with me and having those other guys, you know, playing mix, that was the best things. And that's how I got introduced to Full Tilt and online. Wow, that that whole era is 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 very fascinating, and uh, it, it's it's very very sad how the wheel, wheels came off and how um, a lot of things went wrong as well. But it was definitely something to remember. I remember sitting in my bedroom, living with my parents, w like watching Rail Heaven. Just all I was staying up all night watching Rail Heaven, watching Dwan and Zygmunt and and Ivy and, and 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 all these guys. I call so what. It just all these names came up that came out of nowhere um, and that was a pretty iconic uh, for the people who are watching by the way 
keep those questions coming. I'm going to tackle some more uh, questions that I'm seeing pop up right now on Facebook and on YouTube, by the way. Don't forget to like this video if you enjoy the content on YouTube. Let's let's try to get like 200 likes. That'd be awesome. Um, please like the video if you uh, if you enjoy what we're doing here. Uh, we are still live, by the way, for those who are wondering. Um, we are watching uh, season one of High Stakes Poker. We haven't been paying too much attention to the action, but you guys have all seen this before. We have all seen this before. We're just going to stick to the stories. And if, if, if anything pops out, Ellie, I'm sure you will... Um, okay. You will let us know. Um, Michael asks on Facebook, question for Ellie. Out of the standard group of competition, the guys you played against a lot, which particular player um, got your attention and brought the best out in out of you? Who made you play your best? Which player did you have the biggest rivalry with? Okay, in a, in a series of million games that I play the cash games, and and as you know, I've been known more as a cash games. Uh, uh, I think that... Uh, I'll go back to Chip Reese because he's, uh, I mean, Chip wasn't steaming. I was steaming. This guy wasn't steaming. This guy was sitting in a game with us, playing. Now, no one will tell you everybody winning. You never always win because you, nobody will play with you. But when Chip was losing, he was, uh, sometimes you can sit in our game and lose $200,000 within an hour. The next thing you look at the city is not there, you know? He just pick up his chips and left, you know? And the same thing, uh, you know, uh, talking about cheap A game, you know, a lot of people can have the A game, but when I have my D game, he still stay with his A game. And that's what's nice about cheap. And uh, Phil Ivey does the same. You know, one thing I learned, and that's the biggest lesson I learned in my life was people, a lot of poker player, beginning especially, or even poor, when they have in mind, oh, we're going to play this 25, 50, no limit, or play this game, and we start with $2,000. And if we double up, we should quit. And they do the hit and run, and they do maybe 3000 they should quit. Or We know, all of us, when we lose the first 2000 usually you said, oh, okay, I'll get another bullet. And most of us, if they have more box to go and they'll, they'll win... I saw stuff about Chip and, and, and Phil Ivey that when they lose, they did have the limit. But when they win, I remember a game with Phil Ivey. We played the props. The prop was so big, not as big as Phil Ivey and Zygmunt. Phil Ivey and Zygmunt play $50,000 black and, black and red, you know, on the flap, you know. And, but we played the props with Doyle. For every king, it's 10000 For every king with the queen, is it? And... I think Ivy was up 1.6 million between the game and the props. And Doyle was fucking steaming his head off. He had his vein going out here. He was swearing all the swear in the world, you know, and Doyle, is, he, nev he never keep anything inside. If somebody teach me how to mourn, it's Doyle, you know, <laughs> teach all the old poker player. And Ivy was sitting in a table People left and come back, left. And I think he won like two and a half million dollars. He was literally falling asleep on the table, but he have all the chips because when you're running good, you have to keep playing and keep killing. This is our business. You have to do whatever you have to do. You know, it's a, so that's one thing I learned. I mean, I've seen a lot of, a lot of poker player that I learned from them, a lot of things. And we always have the tight players, people that will come and they believe that poker is only luck. So they're waiting all the time for the ace, ace, deuce, three in Omaha, or they're waiting for the ace, king, or they're waiting. I've seen so many players like that coming and going because you cannot wait. And you know it, Ramco, because you play mixed game. If you don't play enough ends, first of all, it's boring. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. But boring is okay if you're making money. But if you're sitting for so long and you finally play a hand and your opponent knows that you finally play a hand so you have the goods, you know, so you need to take advantage of some situation like that if to see people that do that and read them co correctly. As I told you, when I watch Semi, I pick up some stuff on Semi, I maybe pick up some stuff on Tom. Not a lot, but uh, I've done good only because I realized that, uh, you know, Daniel said loud, I didn't. I just look at some players, you know. And then I remember when Jason came the first time and Galfon came the first time to Ice, Ice Tech, I think season five or four, whatever. I'm, I see some really new meat, what you call it, new blood. And 
I see some talent, you know? I really see some talent out there. They, people that know how to, you know, hold their emotion and just amazing, you know, this. I, I want to take this moment uh, and turn up the audio a little bit because it's you and Sammy in a hand. I saw some talk, so I, I scrolled back a few seconds. I just want to see what you guys are discussing here. I'd what to do here. <laughs> What would you do with A6 a heart in this position? That's what I got. Huh? That's what I got. <laughs> I'll show you what I got. <laughs> sure. I believe I fold over here. I believe he fold me. He... I mean, you're taking the third pair on the board. I mean, for semi, you're right. Semi now, those days, you know, between Sammy and Daniel Nagrano, yeah, showing the um, suited connected, you know, Daniel play more suited connected than even than Tom Duan, you know, but Sammy, Sammy slowly, slowly, I start picking up some stuff that he will definitely raise you on the cam, you know, but then look, when I fold right here, a third pair with the best kicker, I said to myself, he raised it fifteen thousand dollars. I only bet three thousand or whatever. There's no reason to be involved in a big part when I don't have a redraw. Okay, so he bluffed me. So he bluffed me once. He bluffed me twice. And by the way, part of those things that he did, part of his talking, you want to start talking to him. You see, I start the conversation. I told him I have a six a heart, you know. So then he said I have the a six a heart. But he's very smart. But he, he will talk. Yeah, he will talk during big hand. He'll talk. I mean, I remember one of the biggest hand that Maury showed me. Got to be fifth season about him and uh, and uh, Jamie, Gold, Gold. J Jamie Gold, I, the, the Aces versus Kings. He took me to the back, Maury. After the hand was done and everything, he said, "We're gonna show it <laughs> straight to the audience. Literally, we're gonna show all the five or eight, ten minutes, the whole thing." And you know what? That was a pretty amazing hand. That that is so, okay. So I'm working on a list of the best high stakes poker hands of all time, and you guys in the chat, please chime in if you have a favorite. That hand is the longest hand to air ever in high stakes poker history. It's a 10 minute hand, and it takes. <laughs> this is so funny. It takes them six minutes to get to the flop. Six yeah. minutes because I mean, everyone, if you're a fan, you remember this. It goes it goes raise re raise call, and then it goes blind check, blind bet, blind check raise to 30,000. And there's no flop on the table. Anyway. Wow, you remember that good, wow. <laughs> if you guys want to watch that clip, we just released um, a compilation of the of the funniest Jamie Gold moments on High Stakes Poker. It's on a YouTube channel. It's, it's of course, it's the last hand in the segment. So if you want to watch that hand, the final 10 minutes of that video is all about that hand. It's just, it's simply, it's simply mind blowing to see uh, hands like that. And, and it's, 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 we can never go back to that era, but, but I'm so glad that we have, um, have that footage. And uh, I just want to ask you, Ellie, Ellie, yeah. when, when high stakes poker comes back, can you grow out the hair and slick it back the same way you used to? You got it. Okay. I'll do it like me and Sammy doing it right here. I'm going to grow up my hair and see if it grow fast and I put some gel. Yes. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Um, I want to, Ellie, Ellie, I want to give you credit because, um, I'll, I'll just go over a few comments here. Uh, because we have so many amazing comments. Uh, let, let me see. Cool Runner says, Ellie has such an interesting life. Um, uh, Buff says, listening to Ellie live over this is incredible. It's nuts, he says. Um, what else do we got here? Uh, Felipe, Felipe Mojave in the chat on Twitch. He says, Ellie wow. is, is a big legend of the game. Um, a lot of people asking for mixed games. A lot of people asking for Mori. Uh, Muzim says, Ellie is a legend. Um, we, have, we have so many more comments. I'm going to check Facebook. We have uh, many more people there chiming in. Uh, Jonathan from Israel says, Ellie, you're a legend. I hope to meet you one day. Um, just come to Vegas. Come to Bellagio. Ellie is probably going to be there the whole summer if, uh, if things go well with uh, COVID. Uh, Chris says, Sammy is my favorite high stakes poker player. I think we can all agree that Sammy is, is probably everyone's uh, favorite player. I'm going to bring him back. Br yeah, so talk, talk to me about that. The, the, the Sammy Farha era, it seems like there was a stretch of time, maybe 10, maybe 15 years, where Sammy was always, always there. Him and Brandon Adams had the big battle and the big matches. He was playing in, in, in Bellagio. He was playing on all the TV shows. Uh, and, and now uh, from the last thing I heard, he's in Houston. He plays in local card rooms over there. Um, have you spoken to him? How is he doing? Do you know anything about what Sammy's up to I now? I would say nine, I mean, uh, six months before the pandemic started in February. So it would see be last year around September. 
I was uh, the year before, sorry, 2019, I saw him playing in, in the pit. I saw him playing blackjack. And then I go over there and I he said, come on, Sammy. So he said, too many young whales. <laughs> and one of them is Brendan Adams, you know. And I think they basically put a pretty big dent on his bankroll, you know. So I guess he came several times to Vegas and he played only in the pit. He hardly play cash game. Uh, I've been told that, yeah, he play in Houston. He plays small games. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest questions we ever have, where the heck Sammy come up with all the money? To this day, I don't know. I don't want to, you know, predict. I love Sammy. We were a very good competitor. And, uh, you know, there is so many, uh, I mean, hands between us that... Uh, I respect him, I respect his bluff to me, you know. I told you, several times I went home and talking to myself because Dom, Tom Duan and because Sammy too. You know, Sammy did some bluffs in me, into me that, you know, was just something else, you know. I mean, I remember one of the famous end with Sammy was uh, the four aces end, you know. Yeah. And I, I had two aces, I ra he, he raised me before the flap, I raised him, he called. And on the flap, when I flap four aces, Gabe Kaplan said, what is leading into the point? Instead of checking, I let in. And I swear to you, back then, I knew Sammy. I knew that if he have any hand, he'll push it all in. He pushed it all in when I led in with four aces, of course. But he was, first of all, because he have only 40 or 50 or 60 behind. And second, because I know Sammy is pride. If he... Two aces and a small card, he think this king queen is good, you know. He'll try to push it. So I mean those kind of moments of ice stacks, you know, people remember and they they will a lot of people said you have to check for aces. <laughs> no, that thought that day I thought I'll lead into him, you know. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's the type of thing you can definitely do with uh um with Sammy. Um we got three questions on Facebook all about uh Sean Shiki. Um Shiki, of course, became really famous in the 2005 WSP main event, him and Mike Matisau almost getting into a fist fight on day five of the WSP main event. I did a run it back episode with Mike Matisau at the beginning of the pandemic. So this is almost a year ago. And we watched that episode and we broke down all the banter. And then you can see in the background, Moriyas Kandani telling Shiki to, to calm down because Shiki was boiling over. Um, was Shiki real? Was he real like that always when you, when you saw him? Was he like a hothead like that? Yeah, he was, he was. His, you know, his attitude, he sit on the table and he, his attitude is one of the street guys, you know. Shiki, the bottom line, you know, he, he's a family man and he got his daughter and I remember when she was born and everything, but he's wild. Shiki is wild and he will play the game that he want, uh, that he want us to play. Because I want Shiki in a game any day, you know, because you saw there's certain hands that you know that you basically can read what Chicky had. So it's like this guy, like, you know, like the uh, Jerry Bass. You want to play with people like that. You know, it's a, it's very good for uh, people like us. Like I call myself businessman back then, but I'm more like businessman pro. And I want more uh, business people in the game. And Chicky is a business. I mean, he basically retired from poker. I saw him like last year, he came and uh, he had some money from his, uh, tattoo or some other businesses that he opened and he jump in and he plays some games and uh, he jump out but i used to play with him a lot but uh, yeah he's the hot-headed guy you know yeah and we had him on uh, on a poker after dark episode uh, i believe in 2018 or 2019 when he came back and he was same old guy imposing character big guy uh talks fast and he when he looks you in the eye doesn't i don't i don't care how cool you are he's definitely intimidating um, Nick on Facebook is asking, Ellie, if you could go, if you could go back in time, what would you change? Wow. Uh, probably I would say my bankroll management. I mean, Nick, you know how many players falling down because they never manage. And I'm talking about beginner. I'm talking players that got a job that paid them hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars a year. And I'm talking about players that they want to be pros. And the main, the main mistake that everyone make, and I made a lot of it, was the bankroll management. And uh, 
I don't care what business I have, the amount of money that I was playing in the table, no business can hold you, you know, to, to, can hold you and to play all the time, all your life. Not everybody is the cheap and doyle that makes so much money all their life on poker. So yes, if I would go back, I would definitely watch myself, watch my bankroll, know that if I start a game, like the story I just told you about my 1.3 million, I would stop after the 300,000. 300,000 is beautiful. It's like, let's say 100 big blinds and you don't have to go too deep. And when you start steaming, and I don't care who you are, when you start steaming, you, you cannot control yourself. Nobody understand the steam factor, the tilt factor. And once you understand the tilt factor that you have and you can control it, I would definitely change that. And I think it would make me much bigger winner back then, you know? Was it humbling and, and difficult to have to move down the stakes when, whenever that was? Was it tough for you to take, take the direction to the right instead of to the left when you walk into the poker room? It's a very good question because I, uh, I remember when they start, you know, Bobby's room still going and I don't have the money to play Bobby's room game. So I go down and play the two and 400, three and six, and I play the 8160 even. But every time, I remember all the players from there, from there, you know, always come and greet me and come on, come on, Eli, talk to me. Doyle was always, at the beginning, I thought, oh, I don't want to show my face. Look, they know I'm broke. No, I love poker. I told you that. So I love poker. I don't care if I play. I probably cannot play that cheap, you know, but if I play a amount of money that I can win and lose twenty, thirty thousand dollars a night, Nothing is wrong with that. I don't have to go and lose a quarter of a million dollars a night or win, and then I cannot control it, and nobody can afford it, you know? So, yes, I did stuff that I wasn't afford, and no, I wasn't ashamed. It took me time, but I got used to it. And, you know, those days I'm playing right now. In the last year, I've been playing on a site called Kings, and it's only mixed game, and you have to play with your name, and it's only people you know. And everybody play from Gus, Doyle, and Mori. Everybody play with us in this side. And uh, it's only games that we like. And I choose the game with some people, you know, the 10 games. And you sit and you almost sit next to Lyle. You sit next to Freddie Deeb. You sit, so you know who's the player. The full tilt era, I didn't like the idea that I don't know who's the people. And, you know, all, of course, all those uh, mouse uh, rats, I call them, they are good players. A lot of people sit behind the computer and they are good because they have all those I remember the argument between Doug and Daniel Nagrano about have all the stats in front of you you know when you play heads up and stuff I to this day I think that if Daniel will play him even the one game I think he should put like what you told him in your episode he should put a couple more mixed game in there to be fair but even playing the one game when Daniel look at his eyes Daniel is going to do much better Yeah, it's definitely like, a different game. Yeah, like Daniel told you, I feel much better. I got much better. But it's such a big, different game. And Daniel is a field player. He's like us, like me. I can feel my opponent, you know? I, I You know, of course, not everybody will tell you, oh, yeah, you, you play with your glasses or don't play with your glasses and you cannot. It's not that. It's everything together. It's the amount of money they bet. Is the play the way they play with the cheat? Is the comfortable they sit in a table? So many things. And Daniel is legend. He's a legend in these things. I've seen Daniel that didn't have a dollar in his pocket, growing up so fast. You know, because me and Jennifer are here. She is right here. Me and Jennifer are so close. And Daniel basically came for at least a year. Sweat Jennifer every day, every day, and we were talking and everything. You know. And we were doing the poker superstar together and everything else. I mean, everything, all the way to the poker show in the Venetian I did with Daniel and with Scotty, with, you know, a guy like Scotty, for example. He's, he's a, he never played, he played cash only at the beginning, but then this guy for me is only tournament players, you know? And I'm more a cash game player. I would dedicate my time doing the World Series of Poker. I would probably put about 40 to 60 days going to play tournament you know when i have the bets i did have a i play a lot more right now i like to play at least i would say 20 to 25 event that will be the mix event 
And I'll play a few of the No Limit, which the main event, of course, because po poker player, poker pro, they don't play the main event. Gotta be stupid. This is, I remember Doyle telling me, he said, it's like everyone come and buy lottery ticket. <laughs> they buy a regular person, mom and pop buy one lottery. When you buy one, it's like they give you three because you're experienced. And it's still to this day, it doesn't matter. If you run good, you can do the Jamie Gold, you can do the money maker, you can make it. And you, the amount of money is life changing money, you know? I mean, it's it's on my bucket list. I've never played the main event, but I this this, this I know for sure. <laughs> once I play it one time, I want to play it every time. So for me, once I get started on that, and I and I and I maybe stumble into a bag of money somehow, I will I will always want to play the main event because. Alright, okay. guys, everybody out there, please. I'm the first one. I put twelve hundred dollars for ten percent. <laughs> On the next Ramco one, we need nine more. Nine, nine more. Let me know, guys. Let me know <laughs> when, when the main event rolls around. We'll. Uh, I mean, we'll talk. We'll talk. And Ellie, okay. you gotta come play. You know, small mix. Oh, actually, small... right. One of the the media guys came second, right? Well, uh, Gary Gates, of course. Gary uh, Gates, good friend wow. of mine. He finished fourth. What a dream! What a dream! It's still surreal. I watch the footage sometimes. I put it on in the background, and it's like my Amazing. friend who I've known for more than ten years. All of a sudden. He's in. He's at the final table of the main event. It doesn't feel real. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Uh, for, for everyone who's just tuning in, we have tons of viewers. I just want to address everyone who is new and who's just tuning in. We are watching uh, season one of High Stakes Poker, so enjoy the coverage, enjoy, enjoy the content. If you want to watch this uh, High Stakes Poker action without Ellie and I talking, you can do so on Poker Go. We have all seven seasons as well as the latest season, season eight, new episodes. Uh, Rick Solomon, JRB, Tom Dwan, Phil Ivey, Bryn Kenny, everyone's involved. It's, it's, it's epic episodes, uh, some of the biggest plots you'll ever see. Uh, and if you use the promo code HSP, you take $20 off your annual subscription. Um, one more note, by the way, I'm wearing this hat. My, my hair is not great, but um, we have a lot of new merch available in the store. Uh, PokerGoShop.com. Go check it out. We have new hats. We have uh, hoodies, T-shirts, all sorts of cool stuff. I uh, just placed an order for this really cool uh, purple PokerGo hoodie, which I think everyone should get. Um, use the promo code REMKO, my first name, R-E-M-K-O, to take 10% off your total purchase. So go check that out, but not now because we are still doing the show. Ellie, I want to talk about tournaments. I for... have a good story about this guy right there, Jerry Bass. Okay, go ahead. They came to my house. They do the high stake living. I don't know if you ever see it. Card player. Yeah, card player, high stakes living. And uh, Liz, I think, Liz came and they took a picture of me and everything. And I have an 800 gallon aquarium. So now they ask me all the question about cheap and Doyle and whoever in the game and feel and, and this. And then when they, they came and they filmed me next to the aquarium and I used to have shark, you know, small shark and stuff. And then the, the guy that they interviewed me said, show me Jerry Bass. And I told the guy, cut, cut the camera. The late Jerry Bass, yes, it was so much fun to play with. He had so much money. He had the tweet in the world. Oh, your connection is- Interview your, me. Your connection is break, break, fish, breaking up a little bit. Wanted. Let's let's make sure the connection is good you because know, we're, we're missing- One thing about our business and You'll see a lot like Daniel Lagrano, Greenstone, the late Mike Saxton, the, I wouldn't say Phil Ivey so much, but who? Yeah, your connection is, uh, Hello? is breaking up me? a little bit. Yeah, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Oh yeah, you're back, you're back. Let, okay, let's, no. let's do the Jerry Buss story from the start again because we didn't hear that. Okay. okay, so can you hear me good now? Yeah, yeah, you're good now. Hello? Yeah. Go, okay. Go ahead. Jerry Bass from the beginning. So they can basically, they film my, my 800 gallon aquarium and they want me to say that he's a fish. And in our business, I don't like to get business people like that and to make their name dirty. And I told him, no, if you don't cut it, I don't want you to do any of my house and any of my piece. And they took it out basically. And Jerry is one of the beautiful addition to poker in Los Angeles, you know? so many poker players, all the way from JRB to Yosh and this, that Jerry took to the Lakers game and stuff. And what, what I start telling you that people like Daniel Nagrano, the Barry Greenstein, the late Mike Saxton, uh, Gus Hanson, and I said Les Phil Ivey, they are the best ambassador to our poker. 
because so many fans will come and ask you for signature. So I have good stories about those. Gus will get up from any game. Daniel will get up and will get and will get picture even during the World Series. I try to do it all the time, but uh, we went uh, one time to uh, Foxwood, me and Chip and Doyle in one of those private yard playing big game and Doyle was 600,000. And this nice old lady came and she said, uh, she, she, she got to Doyle and said, uh, Mr. Bronson, can I please take a picture with you? And Chip kicked me in the, in the, she said, look at the mistake she made. Doyle turned around, it was so, say, I'm not taking any picture with <laughs> Oh, oh it was so funny, but Phil Ivey also is not the, well, because I think they bother him so much, you know? And sometimes he don't have enough time for himself, but he won't be, I mean, he won't, he's like to, he like to be nice to friend, but he's not giving all the time in the world for that. Yeah, and, and that's why the uh, back hallways of the Rio are always very crowded with the I learned from him, yeah. <laughs> the likes of uh, Phil Ivey and, and Helmuth and, and all those guys going through the back hallways. Um, I want to pivot into tournaments for, for, for a few minutes because I'm very curious. Your first ever cash at the, the your first ever tournament cash was 1996, the United States Poker Championship, Atlantic City, a, a PLO tournament. That was your first ever cash. And then your yeah. first ever WSOP cash was in 1999. I'm curious, when did you first play WSOP? And, and was it a big deal back then? Or was it like a, a distraction from the cash games? Well, I would say the way I say to Phil, Phil Almuth is, he can be the baby. But with us, he's very respectable. He's, you know, we are friends and, uh, you know, the way he cry in the table and everything. But if me or Daniel or anybody else during those era play as many uh, poker games, uh, poker tournament like him, I mean, I would say one name, Billy Baxter. Billy Baxter could have 30 bracelets. And Doyle, he play a lot of those. I remember going already in 95, 96 in the World Series playing cash game. I remember I loved playing with Scotty and them, the two eight or better. And we played, it was big back then, 150-300. And I never pay attention to any of those tournaments. And um, I think that uh, probably when I had less money to play cash game, I jump in one of those and you just told me it's 1999. And in 96, I think that was, yeah, going to Taj Mahal, I think it was right there. I think that I wanted to go and play poker outside. For me, playing po tournament poker was really massive after I won the WPT. I start to realize I can do it. I can beat people. And uh, I mean, everybody that play poker tournament, there's no better feeling than make final table, you know? And that you make it so deep and you got chips. And and uh, Eli Eleza with chips is very dangerous. I don't care who is sitting in my table. And yeah, so I'm gonna, when I went to Melbourne a few times, after I won my WPT, the Mirage Poker Showdown in 2004, I think I went three or four years straight, play so many 10,000 events and fly all over the world and people invite me to and stuff. There's a way to love tournament, but there's a way to get tired of them. And sometimes I look at those guys that flying all over and I said, how can they do it? Because none of everybody make it deep. And once you lose the first day in the main event, you have to catch a flight and go home. And don't forget, I got five kids. I have, you know, five kids and a wife sitting home. You cannot just disappear for a week or two weeks at a time. And, and I had a business back there. So I never, ever really put my time because sometimes I have to be in my store. So never put too much attention to it. Right now, it's like I have a challenge in my head, especially after I told, I told your buddy, Jeff Flat. Last time that uh, interview, he interviewed me in 2019, he told me, when are you going to win the next bracelet? I said, this year, within the stud tournament that came, and I won it. And he showed it after, you know, he had it a piece, and he showed it after. So now I said, well, maybe I'm going to keep making prediction like that. And I need, but I want those tournament to come back, you know, some of those World Series of Poker, to show that this old man still got it, you know. Oh, definitely, definitely, still got it, and and I'm pretty sure the old man, the the old men, flexing in the stud events. That is probably something that you'll never get tired of because those young kids just show up and give their money away. Absolutely, you know, I I, I would you know it, and Robbie know it, and even the young, the smaller limit games and the top, the biggest things in mixed games, 
is once you get to know mixed games and you're sitting with people that just uh, starting or whatever, I think that I don't miss bets anymore. I don't, I don't make mistake like those they make. So I would know how to, when to bet in Raz and when to bet in start Edo better and when to let it go and when to be creative. And those, this is things big when I have, when I play no limit hold them, I'll be a dog to a lot of people. When I play mixed game, I'll know that if I'm, if they miss 5% of the bets or whatever, that's huge, the end of the game. So that's the reason I'm going to stick to mixed game until they put me in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think it's deserving and I think that you'll get there. And I think you're going to keep adding to the collection of bracelets. Uh, for those un unaware, by the way, that World Poker Tour that you won back in 04, um, I just want to name a few names that were there as well because you won it for a million dollars. By the way, these payouts, hilarious. Second place, 500K. Um, Lee, Lee Watkinson, second place. Gabe Kaplan, third. Juwanda, Scotty Wynn, uh, Jim Meehan, Tony G, Alan Cunningham, Chow Jang. That's the top nine. So All the names, yeah. <laughs> everyone was there. Everyone was there. And uh, back in those days when the World Poker Tour was fi first starting to blossom, uh, it was like can't miss poker. Of course, Gus um, won a whole bunch of them and, and, and the brand evolved. And it is still one of the most pre prestigious tours in the world. Uh, and then lately, you've been adding the bracelets because, of course, you have a... Uh, stud eight bracelet, a triple draw bracelet, and then a regular stud high bracelet. And uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to add some another more. Stud high, and yeah. another stud high. Is, another yeah. stud high bracelet. I'm pretty sure yeah, you're going to add some more. Um, <laughs> Felipe Mojave is, is chiming in on Twitch. He says, he says, 2004, I was in diapers. He said, Mojave. <laughs> uh, that's, I, was, I, love, I love Felipe. I was in high school. He's Felipe. another good ambassador for poker right there. Absolutely. Felipe, thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate it. Um, uh, multiple questions have come in over the last hour or so um, about Stu Unger. Did you ever play with Stu? Did you get to know him? Because you started rising as, as he was sort of falling, sadly. Do you have memories of, of playing against Stu? I played Stu 10 times in my life. And uh, I play him in a tournament that he won, that they have the the main event table, the main event table, I play me right there in, in the Fremont Street experience. 97. And I, was in, I was in his table. Not yet. What was it? In 90, 97? 97, yeah. You said 97? Yeah. Damco? Yeah, you, the connection was breaking up, but yeah. In 90, okay, in, in, in any event, yeah. So I play with him, I would say, eight hours in the same table and... I swear I never see something like that in my life. Someone taking control completely. It's like you sit down and you play golf when you're just studying, you play golf with the Tiger when Tiger was in there or play basketball with, with Michael Jordan when he was on top. It just was the most amazing. The guy did whatever he wants in the table. He raised, when you come on top of him, sometime when you come on top of him, he have it. And slowly, slowly, he accumulate all the chips in the table. I play with him twice cash game, and then where he was going to sniff, you know? He was going to sniff in the bathroom some of, some of his cock. And yeah, this, this guy is a natural. He was a natural, uh, but I think I joined pretty late because that's where he was starting going down, you know, with his drugs and everything. Yeah. Yeah, uh, sad story about Stu Unger, obviously. Um, we are working on getting his 1981 and 1997 uh, wow. WSP main event wins on uh, on Poker Go. Of course, he won it in, wow. 80, in 80 as well, uh, but we don't have, or I think that footage doesn't exist. There's something with that, but um, we're still looking into it. If you, if you are, by the way, watching this and you are a collector and you somehow have... Um, VHS tapes that we've never seen before uh, do hit me up on Twitter at Remco Rinkema because as, as a poker historian myself we love to make sure that the um, whole archive is complete and, and Stu is a big part of the archive um, that woman walking into the shot is not about to sit down I think she was taking drink orders um, but Shiki does have uh, pocket jacks if we see any more interesting hands we'll, um, we'll still turn up the volume um, question uh, on Facebook coming in um, of the new age players um, wh which ones um, do you enjoy playing with the most? Uh, the person that play with me mix a couple of times, Bryn Kenny, is pretty fun to play with. He's amazing and he's a very solid poker player. I mean, Jason joined us, Jason Marcia, I would say join us during the high stakes, but he's, for me, he's a new school. He's not an old school, you know. 
He's my he's my age, so yeah, you know it's yeah. So he's definitely new school like you, but uh, yeah, I mean, few of those like you know the Phil Galfon never come and play cash with us. You know, I, I play with Phil when he won his last bracelet. I make final table with him and stuff, and I love the play the way he plays. He's so solid in in pot limit, and uh, I mean, but. Guys that play with us right now, uh, I would, I mean, old school Phil Almuth used to be one of the best to play with cash game, but he got much better. We used to play, wait for him and play, we wanted to play with him, but he got much better. But he put most of his time on tournament, you know, and not big cash game, you know. People ask me a few times, why don't you play the million dollar uh, tournament? Straight up, because I don't like to give money away and I can't even... Uh, compete on those, you know? I remember Sean Deep told me I was in in Bahamas and I came to Sean, I said, Sean, uh, 25,000 going in, let me sell you a piece. So he said to me, Eli, you're old school, buddy. You cannot win this tournament. I, w- don't, I wouldn't throw your money away. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first guy came straight to my face and said, do not play these games. You, those people that put $25,000, uh, 75, 80% of them are solid. You know, people that do only that, you know? I remember they kind of hurt my feeling back then, but shit, he was right, you know? <laughs> I mean... Oh, yeah, so talking about Sean Deeb. Yeah, oh, yeah. Definitely one of the best, best players out there. He's so good. Any game, you take it from the mix game, you know... I. I even Paul, Paul Volpe, you know, the guy that beat me in the heads up for the bracelet on a 10K PLO 8. Paul Volpe is so good, but I don't think that anybody adjusts himself the way that Sean Deeb did. And I mean, I've seen Sean Deeb when he was skinny. <laughs> <laughs> when he was nice. And Sean Deeb is such a good player those days that, uh, I, I mean, he's a guy that definitely one of the guys that is the one to watch for. In any tournament, any poker, any mix game, everything. So, I mean, uh, it's interesting you bring up Sean Deep's name. Um, obviously, there's been some controversy in the past. Um, people's dirty laundry on social media is much easier these days than back in, in, in the days before social media when um, it was not as public. How, how do you look? How do you look at that? And how do you look at? Um, you I know- had two stories. I have a story with Sean Deep, and I have a story with Abe. Those two stories are very simple. When I, a guy didn't manage his money correctly and he borrow money and he make mistake and I'm aware of my mistake and I'm trying to correct them. And uh, I mean, I, I'm not, I never, I mean, even Sean, we decided not to talk about it anymore. I start making some payment to him and stuff. I'm a human being and a human being make mistake and it's done and it's over and it's all i mean show me one poker player that didn't go broke i told you he's not a poker player show me one poker player that didn't make mistake he's not we're making mistake we're learning from our mistake and we're trying to build our name back up and telling people yes we're aware of it you know yeah what advice can you give people that are watching right now that have aspirations as as a poker player like what 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 advice would you give them what's the most important thing that uh, they they should understand I would say, I remember they interviewed me back when we started the show, the high stakes, and I would tell people, don't go and play poker before you have a regular income. If you borrow money from your parents to play poker, you'll never make it. Get a job, maybe get a degree, get something to save money and start playing with your low limit. Start playing in a limit that you can afford and build your game up. And believe me, you'll know if you have it or not. A lot of people think they have it, but they keep going broke and they keep giving you excuses. It's like those gig guys in the, you saw it in the World Series of Poker, they keep stopping you and they give you a bad beat stories. And you know, you can't take it. You want to take your air out. You said, I don't want to hear any bad beat stories. This is our business. This is our sport. You get bad beat, you give bad beats. But if at the end of the year you're making money, you're in good shape, you know? And that's it. That's what counts. You know who's not in good shape right now? Mr. Elia Lezra with uh, set over set against uh, Mr. Jerry Buss. Let's listen to what Gabe has to say. Now, Daniel is out. It's going to cost Ellie 56,000. Sorry? I said Daniel didn't call up and down straight those days. I think he just folded. 
Yeah. He's probably putting Sammy Fahar on a draw. And does he want to gamble and let Sammy Fahar draw? Sammy got the up and down straight. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sammy's still still thinking. I think Jerry will leave in 12 minutes if he wins this hand. If he winds up losing it, he might stay a little longer. <laughs> 50, 52. No, let me tell you about the hand. We, I remember losing it. I said, nice hand. I didn't raise. For me, when a guy like that win, it's very important for our game, you know? It's very important. You don't, it's, it's, it's good to have the tourist or the, the, the guy, that the, the live one to win some once in a while, you know? Definitely. And, and Jerry Buss also, you know, tight player, class character, loves being part of the show. And you could tell that it means a lot to him, you know, to win one. Yeah. Throw his hand away. Sammy, see, he keep playing like he's doing it. I learned this long time ago. I know he's folding, you know? Uh, Sammy is here for the show. TV time. <laughs> he's probably telling the truth. The camera's probably affecting his play here. I think he'd throw away his hand immediately if there was no camera. He knows that one of these guys probably has a set and even if he makes it straight, it might wind up being no good. Once or twice, Jerry. Ellie, you can run it 20 times. You're dead to a deuce. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. By the way, if I would know you have set over set, I would say once only, right? Yeah. I cannot win it twice. Exactly. You can only win it once. <laughs> only uh, one out in the deck. Uh, for the questions that are coming in about Sammy Farha and, and other players, we discussed that earlier in the show. So if you came in later please uh, go and skip back and, and watch the rest of the show because we covered a lot of these topics uh, earlier in the show. And uh, for the people who've been here the whole time, it would be a shame to have to go through those again. But we do appreciate the questions coming in. By the way, uh, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch channels. I do this show live every Thursday, 5 p.m. Pacific time, new guest every week, and always a look at some iconic poker footage. By the way, also, we have a new show about sports betting, gambling, and all sorts of shenanigans called No Gamble, No Future future every tuesday at noon pacific time 3 p.m on the east coast jeff platt and brent hanks on the show talking about all sorts of degenerate shenanigans so maybe we should have ellie on the show one time ellie did you bet sports because i know that guys like mike sexton and everyone they always had big bets were you into sports betting i was in sport betting until i got spanked so many times and i decided those days i'm betting a thousand dollars a game with jrb on all games on NBA and in a in a Super Bowl we went completely nuts and we bet five thousand for an all over and five thousand. The old days I used to bet with the Doyle twenty thousand dollars a game, and uh, I think that I realized after two million dollars that nobody can beat them. So I stopped. <laughs> wow. No, so I don't bet anymore. Spell. I I do it only very for fun because when I watch a game I love to get to gamble on it. You know. Exactly. But uh, I stopped doing any, I don't have any account nowhere. I do it only with my friends and that's it. Yeah, that's, that's probably the way that you should do it, just to have some fun with it. Can you, can you share some insight on the type of legend that Doyle was? Because we all know him as a poker player, but from, from the stories that I'm hearing, you know, it was, it was sports betting and organizing games and he had all the connections and he knew everyone. He's remembered as one of the greatest poker players, but he's basically the greatest hustler of all time, right? Yes, and I think he have it in The Godfather. When you read The Godfather, the, the, his last book, The Godfather Stories or whatever, he have some stories over there. But, you know, sitting with a guy like Doyle and a guy like uh, B Billy Baxter, it's literally like History Channel. I mean, man, this is stories that your joy is falling down. Golf stories that we saw that Mike Sexton told us about in his book and any stories that you want. Yes. He told me about some of his ventures of uh, business ventures. He never, ever made money on business. <laughs> he made money on betting baseball, him and Chip, and they, he had some, some software guy that made it for them. But Doyle has so many stories about the Texas days, you know, traveling and making money and stuff, that uh, we need five shows like yours to just, uh, you know. But I'm glad he's still with us, you know, and Doyle, is one of my idol to I want to die on a poker table. I want to be Doyle's age. I want to keep going. And that's what I want to do. 
you know, some people ask me, but why? You have enough money to pay your mortgage and to do this and to... People don't understand when you love poker, you love it all the way. You can't wait for those Thursday night with your friends. You can't wait for, you know, because that's the fun. You know, some people like to play golf and we like poker, you know, that's what we are. Absolutely. And uh, Doyle said it himself, you know, we don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. And no, it, yeah. no, no truer words have ever been spoken. Uh, and, and that's, of course, from the iconic intro. You know, of, uh, talking about Doyle, about that, I swear to you, I got three or four times Doyle didn't come to the game. And I call and Louise answered the phone. She said he doesn't feel good. The next day, no, Eli doesn't feel good. You know, he said, I drove to his house. I go inside and I said, Doyle, listen, I know you. You need to have the adrenaline. You need to have the screaming. You need to, and don't worry, the next day show up in poker and Doyle go back. He's not sick anymore. I swear four times I did it to him. He sit home. He said, I'm not going to feel good. I'm not. And he showed up in a poker. Doyle need to be, he need to, his, his blood moving. This is Doyle. This is a gambler by heart. Do you share some insights on how Doyle's sharpness um, evolved over time. Because when I speak to players now, they say he might be in his 80s, but his mind is still very sharp. Okay, so this is an amazing question. You, you remember when at the beginning of the show I told you, Chip told me, call Doyle? Now, back then we played three and six and four and eight thousand. And back then we played Chinese so big that you can win in 200,000 in an hour or two hours. And no other player wanted to start game, but Doyle won it. But Doyle decided for some reason, I think there was a period of five, six, seven years, Doyle was weak. He don't remember, you know, stud players need to remember what cards came up on the table, need to memorize it, need to see, and Doyle lost it. And I swear for those period of time, he was losing, losing, losing. And Chip is businessman. <laughs> Like, call Chief, call Doyle, call Doyle. So we used to get Doyle in a game. And yes, that's the time I made a lot of money. But for some reason, in the last, since his 80s, wow. For the last seven years when he's playing, he's still booking nice wins. He's leaving early. I remember Doyle that leave at 2 a.m., 1 a.m., then midnight for a long time, then 11, then 10, because Luis. And now I heard he's leaving even at 9 or 8, because he want to be with his wife all the time. Yeah. Of course, and um, we all know that Luis has been in poor health for, for, for a while and Doyle is home supporting her and the COVID uh, situation. The COVID has at least kept them together at home safe, um, but hopefully we can see Doyle again in action. Um, when I was there uh, covering his, his last live event at the WSOP, seeing him um, leave the venue after he made the final table with Todd was just really sort of a surreal thing to see because he, like you said, you know, it's like the history channel, you know, it's, it's, it's literally history in, in front of us. And, uh, it's so cool that, um, that we have all the stories and we have the, once again, bringing up the book, we have the books and, and, and all those things to, uh, to read about. Um, we only have about 10 minutes left on the show, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions for Ellie, please send them in right now. Um, because, this is your chance to ask some questions. We, we keep getting Sammy Farah questions. We already answered those. Go back in the show earlier. We, we talked a lot about Sammy Farah, and Ellie has promised to try to get uh, Sammy back to Vegas and um, uh, get him into the game. Um, uh, Michael is, is asking on Facebook, um, have you ever played with Nick Shulman? What are your thoughts on his game? Oh, my God. I forgot Nick Shulman. I forgot to bring him as one of the young uh, guns. I forgot. I mean, Nick got the best humor of all poker players. Maybe David Gray got, but David Gray got the same stories. Nick Schumann, I mean, I become friend with Nick immediately, you know, him and Il Ilya and stuff. But Nick, I remember when he started playing the big game, and wow, he's so talented. He's, he's a deep thinker. He's thinking what's going on. I've seen some shows of him playing the cash game and some tournament, and wow. I mean, when I told you Jason Marcia, I'm telling you Nick Schulman is the real things out there. I love Nick. I love the way that he, I mean, just listening to him, you know, when we see some of the shows, the high stakes, just operating, you know, when him and Ali, you can see that Nick is, is one step ahead. He think the way that they, they thinking, you know, and I, want, I know some players who said, yeah, but it's recorded. I've seen Nick's doing stuff when it's not recorded. And the way that you're operating on certain end is really good, you know? 
absolutely. Um, Make it the best. Uh, poker, chess, and other stuff on Twitch is asking, what's your all-time favorite poker game to play? Uh, I love any variants of the Deuce to Seven now. So it's either No Limit or the Triple Draw. But I think that I'm doing much better in any variants of the Oma the better, the PLO Oma the better. And those are the two that definitely make me money in my cash game and in my uh, tournament. Uh, Shrey is asking, did you sell action when you played on high stakes poker? No, I never sell action in any of those games because who will be in his right mind to buy action from a guy like me that <laughs> sometimes can go wild on the game and uh, try to bluff 100,000. But uh, no, I think my brother, my brother-in-law, I sold him one time 10% or something. But, uh, you know, we, first of all, we make sure we have a rules in Bobby's room that you are not supposed to sell action to anybody play with you. Right. You do, you're supposed to tell all the table. So on those high stake, we didn't. Sometimes I would say if we play very high and somebody buy 10 or 20% for me, then you say it in the table. But in this particular show, no, I didn't. When I took the pain, I took the pain myself. And when I, you know... <laughs> Uh, we got some questions coming in about biggest win, biggest loss. We also discussed it earlier in the show. Please go back and check that out. Um, Polar Boyak is asking, how much does the dealer make in the high stakes games? And, and maybe also a question for me, what's the biggest tip you've ever seen to a dealer? I mean, I know that w when we play now in Poker Go, I usually, the first one that ask everyone for $300, 200 or whatever, to immediately give the dealers so we know that all the dealer making, if we are seven of us, they'll make 2,100 or they'll make whatever and they'll split it between themselves. And usually the guy that win the most, sometimes we make this rule that if we play poker after dark, the guy that win the most leave another couple thousand dollars. But uh, because we don't do, at the beginning, I don't know if you saw, we took $5 and we put it next to us and we start tipping, but it's not good for TV, I think. So we decided not to do it anymore. Have you ever seen a crazy big tip in Bobby's room or, or something crazy happen? I think that uh, Ivy gave by mistake to a, a valet $5,000 chip. The valet go after him and Ivy said, because you're honest, you end up $1,000 to him, you know? The fun, the the fun I, what I see with Phil, I went with Phil to Bahamas. I just never see something like that before. We flew in a private jet to the Bahamas. They, they, Couple of days before, he took a twenty-five thousand, you know, the pink chips for me, and he said, "Bring whoever you want. It's fifty thousand dollars to go to Bahamas." So I gave it to him. Don't worry, he came with his nutrition, his personal trainer, his friend, his this. I brought only my my friend, you know, David. I beat him for one hundred seventy thousand on the plane playing Chinese. But when we landed, first of all, he took about four thousand. He gave the pilots. Then he took another stack of all hundreds. Anyone that opened the limo card, he gave him a few hundred. Anyone that is a few hundred, a few hundred. Phil Ivey was one of the biggest tippers I've seen. Wow, that's incredible. Funniest little side story that Nick Shulman once told me, uh, where Nick Shulman asked Ivy to pay the masseuse, and he, he, he threw the masseuse $5,000. And he says, Nick, you got me back, right? And then what, what are you supposed to say? It's Phil Ivey. <laughs> Uh, pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> I know it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, final call, by the way, for questions. We're going to take a few quick ones. Um, describe Tom Dwan in one word. Scary. Scary. Great. I love that one. For the people in the chat, how would you describe Tom Dwan in one word? Please um, let let it, let us know in the in the chat as well. Um, Unreadable and uh, and uh, fearless. Exactly. Um, this is, by the way, also an iconic hand. Barry versus Sammy, aces versus kings. Oh, wow. um, let's let's just listen and enjoy this one. Five hundred dollars in the pot. He can walk away here a big winner by making the greatest lay down in No Limit Hold'em. <laughs> Never happening. If I had a guess, I would say it's 50-50. <laughs> he knows that Barry's either got aces, maybe the other two kings, and maybe a pair of queens. But it really looks like Barry's got the aces. I'm gonna be sick to my stomach. Fifty more, right? 
With this hand, Sammy's entitled to take as much time as he wants. <laughs> By the way, this is, I remember, the, where you ask him now twice. And I remember the answer of Barry. And I believe after that, Barry started going twice. But he's taking <laughs> a different sort of time than he did earlier today. Yeah, he's really thinking about this. This is the biggest decision a no limit hold'em player can fun, make. Barry. It's almost a four hundred thousand dollar decision. Yeah. Sammy tries to sneak a glance at Barry, who's not showing anything. Go home. It's <laughs> over. Go home. That's the thing. <laughs> the other players are like fans that got up and almost left the stadium and now are coming back to their seats. So you didn't miss anything. That's the last end. You see, I wrecked my chips. Yeah. Last end of the, ni of the night. Both here and, and on the show. I'm all in. I call. That's it. The you got aces, right? I know. You got Deep. queens? <laughs> kings. Kings? Deep. I can't get away aces from against kings. kings. Want two flops? Five and five? No. Let's go. He never go twice, by the, the way. The pot is a mind blowing. He really twice really when he starts going broke. Yeah, oh yeah. Hard cash. Sammy and has Barry. Asking him again after the flop. Oh yeah, I remember that. Let's see. And Barry very politely declined. It's amazing. It's like, like a cold deck. What do you want to do? It's not over. I bet you, you the flop ace king is going to come. You might win. Yeah, I'm favored to win as usual. It's aces <laughs> against kings as we head to the flop. Jeez. Oh, Six he got king. a king. Oh, he got a God. king. Unbelievable. <laughs> he got a king. <laughs> what are we going to do now? Want to deal twice? Barry's going <laughs> to no? need an ace or the two hearts. Let's go. Terrible break Super for Barry first. Greenstein. How do they do it? Seven of spades on the turn. Let's Barry's go. down. To the last card, he needs one of the two remaining aces. Well, gotta take a deep breath. Hold it. <laughs> Sammy's whole attitude oh. has changed a little bit here. Why they yeah. want him back? <laughs> oh man. Three of diamonds on the river, Sammy Farhar. And that has Sammy locking up the biggest pot in high stakes poker history up until that point. Uh, of course, that record was broken many, many times. Uh, there's there's Ellie with the rose, which became <laughs> iconic. You gave the rose to to Zygmunt, I believe, on a later season. Oh man, good times. Um, Ellie, thank you so much for being on the show. I think it's fit, fitting that we leave it here on this uh, on this frame. Very excited to uh, have you back in 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 the games soon. Um, Obviously, we should we should grab dinner at some point later this year. Remco, you do, guys, Remco doing an amazing job. Keep watching every Thursday. Amazing, amazing for poker. I appreciate that. For you guys who are watching at home, if you're new to Poker Go, please subscribe. Use the promo code HSP to take $20 off the annual sub. Then it only becomes $7 a month for Poker Go. And guess what? These new High Stakes Poker episodes and all these massive tournaments that we are putting on every single year, those are not cheap. So we appreciate the support. We appreciate you guys uh, being with us. And let's just all cross our fingers and be careful and be safe and have uh, the World Series of Poker back at some point later this year because, man, I am just craving to walk down that hallway to the Amazon room and hearing the, the chips like crickets in the night. It's just something that I miss so much. Um, once again, uh, for everyone watching, on your way out, don't forget to like this video. We'd love to get the likes. Share it with your friends if you enjoy the show and let me know in the comments who should be on the show next. I have a lot of guests lined up, but I'd love to hear from you guys who should be on the show. For Elia Lezra, my name is Rem Korinkama. You can find me on Twitter, at Rem Korinkama. Um, my DMs are always open. So if you want to send me a message or anything, or have any request, please send those over as well. I'll be back next week on Thursday, 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern. And uh, you can catch Jeff and Brent, No Gamble, No Future, on Tuesday at noon Pacific. For now, this was Run It Back. Good luck.